Okay, so now we're going to start with chapter 8. And chapter 8 is where we're going to cover the whole notion of electron configurations and how they're related to the properties of atoms and also how they're related to the positions of the elements in the periodic table. So, in a multi-electron atom, as you can imagine, because the electrons are negatively charged and the nucleus has the protons which are positively charged, there are several forces at work here, right? So, the electrons will be repelling each other while there will be attraction between the electrons and the protons in the nucleus. So those are the various forces that would be in operation within any multi-electron atom. Now if you consider the hydrogen atom, since there's only one electron in the hydrogen atom, then basically what you'll find is that the only force of attraction will be between that one electron and the nucleus, right? So therefore, the hydrogen electron, the one electron, will have no repulsive force because there are no other electrons around to um, influence its, its motion, so to speak. The result of that is that what you'll find is that the orbitals will be arranged, as you can see here. So the lowest orbital of lowest energy would be the 1s orbital, right? That would be in the first energy level or the first shell. And by the way, the formula for the energy levels or the shell is given by the same equation we saw before by Rydberg. So this is the energy level of the 1s orbital and then the second shell which contains 2s and 2p orbitals will be located here and then the third shell will be located here which contains 3s, 3p and 3d and so on and so forth. So it's a rather simple arrangement for the hydrogen atom. But when you get to a multi-electron atom things are a bit more complicated. So to show you how things are different, I have here side by side the orbitals in terms of their energy for the hydrogen atom, which we just spoke about, and then this is for the typical multi-electron atom. And there are a couple of things that you'll notice immediately. The first thing you'll notice is that on average, the energy of all the orbitals in the multi-electron atom will be lower compared to the similar orbitals in the hydrogen atom. So for example, the 1s orbital for the hydrogen atom is here, but for the multi-electron atom, it's all the way down here. For the 2s and 2p orbitals, their energies are here in the hydrogen, but they're drawn down further in the case of the multi-electron atom. And you'll see that also for the others. Another thing you'll notice is that within each energy level, in the case of the hydrogen atom, where you have more than one orbital, they will be of the same energy for example, the 2s and the 2p, all right? So that's what happens in the case of the hydrogen atom. In the case of the multi-electron atom, you don't see that. You see the 2s orbital being drawn lower compared to the 2p orbitals. And then you see something similar happening between the 3s and 3p and 3d orbitals that are of the same energy here, but when you come over here, the 3s orbital would be of a lower energy compared to the 3p which in turn will be low in energy compared to the 3D, right? So those are the complicating things that will occur in a typical multi-electron atom, all right? So as a result, it's very, it's not straightforward um, how the energies will be arranged because what you'll find is that as you go higher and higher, there are some overlap between lower orbitals of certain um, energy levels and higher orbitals. And we're gonna see how we can predict the orders shortly. Um, but what you'll find is that within each shell, this is what you'll observe in the multi-electron atom. The s orbitals will be of a lower energy than the p orbitals, which in turn will be of a lower energy compared to the d orbitals, which in turn will be of a lower energy compared to the f orbitals. All right. So, um, let me see here. I think I covered this already. The higher numbered principal shells um, of different principal shells have nearly identical energies. Okay, let me just skip this here for the time being and move on to the next page. So, when we're talking about the electron configuration, we're basically talking about how the electrons are distributed among the orbitals in an atom. Now, there are several ways we can represent it. Um, the most common way is by using the SPDF notation, right? And this uses numbers to designate the principal shell and letters to identify the subshells and a subscript which indicates the number of electrons within the designated shell. So for example, if you see this 1s2, right? 
the one represents the energy shell, right? The first energy shell where n is equal to one. The s refers to the type of orbital, s orbital, for which l is equal to zero. So we're talking about the subshell level here. And this two here, which is written as a superscript, indicates the number of electrons within the 1s sublevel. All right, so this is what you see most often when you're given the electron configuration, which shows how the electrons are distributed. Um, so that's one way of representing it. Another way is by using what is known as an orbital diagram. So basically in an orbital diagram, what we do is that we use boxes to represent um, orbitals and we use arrows to represent the electrons, right? So this, if I'm not mistaken, is the orbital diagram for the element um, seven, so that's f nitrogen, right? Nitrogen has seven electrons. So the first two electrons go here in the 1s orbital, the second two will go into the 2s orbital, and then each of the three 2p orbitals will be singly occupied by an electron, all right? And we use the arrows here to indicate the spin. Remember, we talked about the fact that electrons will spin in one of two directions. So this represents the electron spinning in one direction, and the arrow pointing down represents the electron spinning in the opposite direction. So this is an orbital diagram, as I said before, and it gives more information than the SPDF notation in that it tells you exactly how the electrons are spinning, one and two, exactly which orbitals, especially when it comes to a set of p orbitals like this, which orbitals will be occupied by electrons. Um, okay, and another thing I want to point out here, which we're going to talk about later on, is the fact that whenever you have two electrons occupying the same orbital, according to a particular rule, which we're going to learn about later on, you cannot have both electrons occupying the same orbital and spinning in the same direction. The two electrons occupying the same orbital must be spinning in opposite directions. So that's why you see that here, and that's why I see this here. Okay, so um, when it comes to what is called the ground state configuration, if, we, if you remember, we were introduced to this terminology um, in the previous chapter. We said that the ground state configuration is the lowest energy configuration, and we can apply that to configurations um, where electrons are occupying orbitals. If you have a situation where the electrons are occupying the lowest available energy orbitals, then we say that that configuration is the ground state configuration, right? So just to give an example, um, this particular element, um, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, so this is supposedly representing oxygen. Now, this particular configuration that you see here is not the lowest energy configuration, and the reason why is because you have a p orbital, or I should say an s orbital here, that has only one electron, but you have more electrons in the next higher level. So therefore, in order for you to get the lowest orbital configuration or the lowest ground state configuration, one of these electrons would have to go into this two s orbital spinning in the opposite direction, all right? So the actual configuration, if I can go into the pen mode here, let me um, do that. So the highest or the lowest or ground state configuration would be where the electron would be here and this electron would not be there, all right? And therefore that would be the ground state configuration of oxygen. Okay, now here you see a rule which is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And what this rule says is that no two electrons in the same atom may have the same set of four quantum numbers, all right? And the ultimate um, conclusion or consequence of that rule is that orbitals will hold a maximum of two electrons and the spins must be opposed. So this is what I was referring to earlier. What Pauli's exclusion principle is basically saying is that if you have two electrons occupying the same orbital, then um, the spins must be opposed. And also, each orbital can have no more than two electrons, all right? So, that's another rule when it comes to electron configuration. This third rule, um, named Hun's rule, is um, used to describe a situation where if you have orbitals of identical energy and you have electrons entering orbitals, 
then basically electrons will have to enter into orbitals whenever possible. So this configuration that you see here is a violation of Hund's rule, right? Because you have two electrons occupying one orbital here, but you have a vacant orbital here. So basically, according to Hund's rule, the, uh, the most stable configuration would be where this electron is over here, all right? Another consequence, too, is that electrons in half-filled orbitals must have parallel spins. So this electron that goes here must be spinning in this direction I'm about to show you. So it should be spinning in this direction, right? So the correct configuration is where this electron here moves from here and goes into this orbital right here. And that would be the most stable configuration, all right? So that is also incorrect, all right? Because in this case, you have these two electrons spinning in the same direction, but this electron in the middle is spinning in opposite opposite direction. So therefore, if I were to correct this, I would simply change that to this. All right? So if you have electrons that are singly occupying a set of orbitals that are equal in energy, such as the 2p orbitals, then the electrons must be spinning in the same direction. Okay, so this is basically a summary of how the electrons are distributed among the different orbitals within the different subshells and within the, within the different shells. So in the first shell, you have only an s orbital, right? You have only one orbital um, in that um, shell. Um, the maximum capacity would be two, right? And the principal shell capacity would be two as well, right? Because that's the only subshell that is present in that shell. When n is equal to 2, you have two types of orbitals. You have one s orbital and three p orbitals, and therefore the maximum number of electrons that can go into the s sublevel is 2. The maximum number of electrons that can go into the um, p sublevel would be 3, uh, or 6, I should say, and therefore the total maximum of electrons that can go into the second shell would be 8. And you can therefore rationalize what will happen as you go into higher um, shells, all right? Okay, um, some other rules that you need to be aware of. Now, this diagram here, I always tell my students to memorize it because what this does is that it gives you the order of the orbitals as they appear in any atom, right? So the way I used to do this as a student, the way I used to memorize it, is that I would write down 1s, 2s, all the way to 7s down here, and then I'll start here, 2p, 3p, all the way to 7p. And then I'll write 3d, 4d, 5d, 6d, and then 4f, 5f here. And then I'll draw the arrows. And the arrows indicate the order of the energies of the orbitals. So therefore, following the arrows from, head, um, from tail to head, um, you start off with 1s, then 2s, then 2p, 3s, then 3p, 4s, then 3d, 4p, 5s, and so on and so forth. All right? So when you assign the electrons, keeping in mind the maximum capacity of each sublevel, you're going to get 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, which is here, then 4s2, then 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, so the off-bar principle. The off-bar principle is basically the way we actually build up the electron configuration of an atom based on its identity. So in the case of hydrogen, that's very simple. It has only one electron, so that electron goes into the 1s orbital. The next element in line is helium, and in that case you have two electrons in the 1s sublevel. When you get to that stage, that means that that sublevel is completely full. So when you get to lithium, where you have to add an electron to the he helium electron configuration, that electron will go into the next higher orbital, which is the 2s orbital, all right? And so on and so forth. And um, let me just say here that there is also another way of writing the electron configuration. It's called the abbreviated electron configuration. And to get to the abbreviated electron configuration, what you do is that you look at your configuration and you ask yourself the question, what is the closest group 8 element that comes before it in the periodic table? Now, 
in the case of lithium, that group 8 element would be helium, right? And if you compare the electron configuration of helium to lithium, you'll see that basically the configuration of helium is actually a part of the configuration of lithium where you have 1s2, right? Because the configuration of helium is 1s2. So to get the abbreviated version, all you have to do is replace the 1s2 with the symbol of helium within square parentheses and then you write down what's left after. And when you do that, this is what you get, right? You get the configuration of helium represented by the symbol for helium in square parentheses and then 2s1, all right? Now, this is not really much of a difference in terms of abbreviation, but as you can see, if you extend to larger um, elements, larger atoms, you can see the convenience of writing the abbreviated version, all right? Um, in fact, if you look at carbon, right? This is the electronic configuration of carbon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. This is the orbital diagram representation, right? Now, as far as the abbreviated version is concerned, as I said before, you consult the periodic table, you look for the element in group 8 that comes immediately before this element, and that again will be helium. The electronic configuration of helium will be 1s2. So basically to get the um, to get the, the abbreviated version, um, the electron configuration would be helium in square parentheses. Now, there's an error here because you should have 2s2 right here. So let me correct that here. Um, so the actual answer here will be HE um, 2s2 2p2. All right, so that would be the correct answer for the electron configuration, the abbreviated electron configuration of carbon. All right, and then if you look at the next element, which is nitrogen, to get from carbon to nitrogen, you simply add one electron to the 2p sublevel, and then you get this. This needs to be corrected as well. You should have a 2s2 here. So let me do that here. Whoops. This should be helium in square parentheses followed by 2s2 and 2p3. And then the next electron configuration where you add one electron again to the 2p sublevel, so you end up with 2p4. And um, again, I need to correct um, this right here. So this will be 2s2, 2p4. So this is not right. This is not right. That is not right. Okay, so that's a correction there. And then if you add one more electron to this, you're going to get 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And the correct electron configuration here is going to be, let me cross this out, is going to be helium 2s2, 2p5. And I think the next one I have in line is neon. And in that case, this would not be correct. It would be helium 2s2, 2p6 all right okay and then that basically completes the second row of elements in the periodic table and you can continue to figure out the electronic configurations of other um, atoms all right um, okay now there are some elements that are located in certain regions of the periodic tables which are called the main group elements and what they have in common is that as you go from one element to the next in those regions, you're adding electrons to either an s orbital or a p orbital, right? So those elements are known as the a group elements, right? And those are, um, well, for one thing, the first 20 elements in the periodic table belong to that region, and therefore they are the a group elements. Um, and then you have the transition elements where as you go from one element to the next 
basically you're adding an electron to um, some other orbital. Usually it's a d orbital or an f orbital as you go from one element to the next. And those elements are known as the transition elements, right? So for example, in the fourth period, even though you have the n equal 4 shell as the outermost shell, you're adding electrons actually to the 3D subshell level, all right? Um, so you can see that here. Now what they have shown you here is basically the orbitals for the 3D and the 4S. They have not shown you explicitly the other orbitals for brevity's sake. They basically use this to indicate the rest of the electron configuration, argon within square parentheses, all right? So this is the electronic configuration for scandium. It's argon plus what you see here. Or if you want to look at it in terms of the SPDF notation, this is it right here. Argon with 3D1, 4S2. And then the next element, you add an electron to one of these orbitals. And then you add another electron to get the next element. Add another electron to get the next element until you get to chromium. Now chromium is a bit weird in terms of bucking the trend. Um, you'll notice that the um, in the case of chromium, the 3D orbitals are evenly, um, the electrons are evenly distributed among the 3D orbitals, all right? And then you have one electron that is hanging out here, right? Now, if you were to follow the trend, you would be inclined to think that the electron configuration of chromium would be this. Let me just use the one before it as an example. You'd think that the electron configura configuration of chromium would be this, right? but that's not the case right it turns out that it is more stable for chromium to adopt this electron configuration where this d subshell is half filled as well as this 4s subshell is half filled all right so that's a bit of a unusual anomaly um, exhibited by the electron configuration of chromium now to get from chromium to manganese you simply add an electron here right to get this electron configuration and then to get from manganese to iron, you add an electron here to get this. And then to get from iron to cobalt, you add an electron here to get this. And then to get from cobalt to nickel, you add an electron here to get this electron configuration. And then we get to another unusual um, configuration, and that is copper. Because one would think, again following the trend, that to get from nickel to copper, you just simply add an electron here. But that's not the case. You're going to end up with this here, where one of these electrons will be transferred over here, and you end up with this electron configuration, right? Um, and this is also very stable, because here you have a complete filled set of 5d orbitals, and you have a half-filled d orbitals here. So the summary of those two unusual elements in this regard, chromium and copper, is that it is more stable um, to have the set of orbitals either half filled or completely filled all right so that's basically what happens and then to go from copper to zinc you just simply add an electron here whoops and you get this configuration right here okay so um, let me move on to this now this is a version of the periodic table which shows you the outer shell orbital distribution and basically you see some trends right um, the first of which is that the period number now you know the periods are the rows so the first period starts with hydrogen and goes to helium the second period goes from lithium to neon the third period from sodium to argon and so on and so forth and basically based on the electron configuration we can tell something about the location of the element in the periodic table. One thing we can tell is that the period number, right, is the same thing as the principal quantum number of the electrons in the valence shell. Now the valence shell, by definition, is the highest outermost occupied shell, right? So basically, if you choose any element, let's say arsenic, right, if you choose arsenic, arsenic is in period one two three four right and therefore if you look at the outer shell electron configuration of argon 
you see 4S2 and 4P3, all right? So that tells you that the outermost shell um, has the, or the electron is occupying the fourth shell as the outermost shell, all right? And you can look at any other orbital or look at any other element and you'll see the same thing. So that's one thing you can tell from the um, position of the element in the periodic table. You can tell which element or which shell is the valence shell or the shell that is the outermost occupied shell. All right. Another thing you can tell from the periodic table is the group A elements, right? Those A elements, we're talking about elements in groups 1A. Let me change back to this here. Um, so group 1A, 2A, and then over here you have 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A, right? And if you look at these elements in these groups, what you'll find is that their group numbers would be equal to the number of electrons in their outermost shell, right? So if you look at, for example, oxygen, the total number of electrons in the outermost shell of oxygen is 6, 4 plus 2, 6, and you see it belongs to group 6A. If you look at, let's say, germanium, it's in group 4A, and look here, it has a total of 2 plus 2, 4 electrons in um, 4A, in germanium, all right? So that's another thing you can tell from the position of the element in the periodic table in terms of the electron configuration. Okay, um, this is just a summary of the different blocks of elements within the periodic table. Um, these elements in groups 1a and 2a are called the uh, s blocks because as you go from one element to the next you're adding an electron to an s orbital these elements in this region they're called the p blocks because as you go from one one element to the next you're adding an electron to the p orbitals and then this block right here is known as the d block elements also known as the transition elements um, as you go from one element to the next you add an electron to the d orbital and then down here you have the F block elements um, and as again as you go from one element to the next you're adding an electron to an F orbital all right um, collectively the S block and P block elements are known as the main group elements or the A elements and therefore the groups have the letter A following the respective group numbers these elements um, they're known as the D block but you'll notice that their um, group numbers are well, numbers along with the letter B, all right? Um, and then down here, these are the F block elements, which are no, also known as the inner transition elements, all right? Okay, so um, those are just some other relationships one can identify um, based on the electron configuration in relation to the positions of the elements in the periodic table, all right? Okay, um, I'm going to stop here and um, continue in the next video with a discussion of some valence electrons and core electrons relationships in the um, electron configuration.